at that particular time, I was traveling the world commentating on MotoGP, um, which is like the elite level of, of motorsport. That's one thing I'm working on at the moment as a parent is that it's not about forcing your children to be happy, it's about the honesty. Parenting truths, that's what we want, we want truths. <laughs> you're in your 20s you assume we'll have two or three kids there's going to be two years between each they'll be best of friends we'll get pregnant we'll have a baby and then when you actually start trying to have a family either you get smashed in the face with you know miscarriage and baby loss or and also you find yourself getting jealous of other parents because you're, you're looking at children you're looking at parents with children the same age as charlie and they're you know sitting in a coffee shop quiet really polite listening to okay so we're rolling season one of the parenting truths podcast i'm joined by steve day thanks for joining me today steve yeah, it's a pleasure, Tom. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. So I was super keen to chat to you today, Steve, because I know your sort of work parenting life balance is a little bit unorthodox. I know my, myself, I worked basically a, a working from home nine to five, but chatting to you, you're quite one minute you could be quite um, intense in work and then another minute you could be home with your child for quite a prolonged period and you need to be quite reactive so I wanted to try and to unpick some of that today what I want to try and do with all my guests is just to start right at the beginning so are you able just to provide a bit of context into your journey into parenthood just take us back to before you became a parent sort of where were you and your partner when you sort of decided that you wanted to kick off um, family life yeah sure um, so my wife Linny, we um, we've been together for fifteen years this year, and back in twenty sixteen we got married. Um, the following year, unfortunately, um, her dad passed away um, through cancer. It was a, it was a really really tough year, um, and we went um, after that. We sort of we sort of, we obviously delayed our honeymoon because of her dad's illness, and um, after we got. Yeah. Honeymoon. That was when we decided to start planning for a baby because we were both at that point just ready. It had kind of gone past the point in our eyes of um, it being a shock to the system. We were both reading from the same page. We both really wanted to be parents, um, and so that was when we, you know, started trying um, and we fell pregnant pretty quickly, um, which was was really really nice. Um, at that particular time, I was traveling the world commentating on MotoGP, um, which is like the elite level of, of motorsport. I've, I've you know, been doing that for a few years, um, which is a, a job that saw me traveling away a lot to multiple different countries. There's about 18, 19 rounds a year where they're all abroad. You follow the championship around. And um, my wife was working in recruitment at that particular time. Um, and then when Charlie came, as ever, with any, um, with any couples that haven't experienced uh, life as a parent yet, um, <laughs> our world was sort of rocked when, when little Charlie arrived. Um, and from the first day we, we brought him home, we were like, wow, okay, what, are we, what do we do here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm not sure there's any, because I chat to quite a few expecting dads via the dad vibes, and I'm not sure there's anything that can really prepare you for that moment you sort of walk through the house th through the front door of the house there's no medical professionals it's just you and your partner and I know I remember with Luca our first it was like how do we know if he's going to be too hot too cold how often does he need to sleep how long do we need to wake him up to change a nappy and it was just it seems so daunting that you'll never figure out and, and weirdly we're having the same so we've got a uh, 12 week old and it all starts again you quickly forget the newborn days and it's like you know is she too hot is she too cold and you know when when does she need to to go down for a nap and, and all that and it, you just go through it all over again um but yeah i don't think there's anything that can prepare you other than just diving in with both feet i think yeah and also i think you just find yourself wondering what on earth you used to do with your spare time as well because um, we obviously had stacks of it, but we weren't doing a great deal with it. Because that all disappeared as soon as uh, Charlie arrived. Um, so yeah, it was. A and did your sorry just to just to ask, did your job play on your mind a little bit when you were trying for a family? Because obviously, I assume you were at all eighteen stops of the MotoGP. Um, did you have a have a think about how that would play with a newborn, or was it literally just you'd continue working? 
and your wife would be home with the baby? Well, I discussed it at length with, with Linny. I mean, I was, um, the advantage I had was I was working with some people that had not that long ago had children. <laughs> that had been working in the industry with children that were grown up as well. And so I was constantly asking them questions about it. And we thought that certainly in the beginning anyway, that we, we have to, I have to continue doing my job and we'll see how it goes. But I think it was, it's fair to say that there was some anxiety there because I didn't really know how that was going to work. I didn't know how Linny would cope with a baby, with me traveling away um, and sometimes the other side of the world. So it was definitely something that was on my mind um, before Charlie arrived. And the I suppose in the, in the beginning, the only advantage to me traveling away was the fact that I could get some sleep. Because uh, yeah. before, before that, um, I actually used to struggle to sleep on planes. I'm not the greatest traveler, which is a bit ironic given my job. Um, but because of just having a kid... Um, yeah, I was getting on planes and just going straight to sleep. And so that was about the only advantage to it um, in the early stages was the fact I was actually able to get some kit. <laughs> and I, I assume there's no paternity leave or anything like that with your job. It's literally, you, you know, you can't check out of a couple of stops of the MotoGP and be at home. It's literally just that continues as normal. And then you work family life in and around that. Yeah, I mean, they, they were pretty flexible. But we had a few things going on that they allowed me to have a few weeks off. But I suppose in a way... <clears throat> We were quite lucky, actually, and it wasn't planned this way, but Charlie was born in mid-February and the season didn't start until uh, the end of March anyway. And so okay. that actually worked out quite well. So I already had four to six weeks at home before I started traveling. So that actually the timing of that worked out really well. So that wasn't a massive issue. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're finding with Mia, our second, um, you know, we've had to change things up a little bit because now obviously we're juggling a newborn and a, an almost five-year-old and um, me and my wife like to try and we both work from home she's obviously on maternity leave we like to try and do everything together but it got to a point where you know if there's a sleepless night there's a sleepless night for both of us and then we're both broken in the morning especially when Luca comes running in at 6 a.m and there's and no one slept so yeah I guess having that separation I manage you're quite fresh when you when, when you come back from a from a stop yeah, that actually, it was in, certainly to begin with, it worked out quite well because I'd be away. And although there, might, there would be moments where Linny would be worried and she'd call me um, and I'd be thinking, oh, I wish I was at home. Um, when when I got home, it was a case of Linny just passing me Charlie and saying, right, your turn. I need some rest now. And, and it worked quite well. And we're quite yin, yin and yang. We work from the same page with what we do anyway. And, and that was always well, it's such an important thing as parents um, for you to try and read from the same page with everything. Um, otherwise things go horribly wrong. And so it wasn't, I'd say until a couple of years, until he turned a couple of years old, which obviously we'll go on to, where all of a sudden it became apparent that me working abroad wasn't gonna be great for Charlie and, and wasn't gonna be great for me as a dad. Right, okay, yeah. Um, so, you, so you mentioned there about both being singing from the same hymn sheet essentially is that something that you've consistently done throughout Charlie's life are you both on the same page when it comes to sort of your parenting approach with Charlie we are yeah I think we're we're naturally really calm people um and we we knew from day one that we didn't want to go for I don't know a good cop bad cop approach we wanted to be yeah you know at one with each other discuss it like adults when we're not got Charlie to sort of you know tackle it the best way because if you're both on the same page it, it makes you both calmer and if you see you know if I see Linny running out of patience I can take over and if you know if it's the other way around and so that has been a, a helpful tool throughout Charlie's life so far um, so very rarely do we ever you know there might be moments where we disagree about a certain parenting tactic or you know yeah that that just happens but generally speaking yeah we we're on the same page yeah, I think it's hard to get every little scenario bang on, but general, like I think a general approach. If you're on the same page, like I, I chat to parents quite regularly via the dad vibes, and you know I, I haven't got personal experience of it, but it seems so stressful when there are complete loggerheads, complete polarizing views. Someone's more fear-based parenting, and the other one's completely the opposite. That just has an 
a whole extra dynamic of stress to an already stressful like situation of a you know a toddler meltdown or a tantrum and i think if you are on the same page one thing i find is a little bit like a seesaw like if you're struggling the other one because they're tuned into the way you want to parent can sort of identify that and they your, your partner sort of overcompensates and helps and, and dives into help and then you know similarly when they're struggling you know you can pick up on that a lot easier and you can dive in if you're both sort of moving in in the right direction with your general approach yeah and no, i mean that was really important for us and, and that was kind of how we came across you as well because we would look um online on, on instagram linny would follow some some people giving advice and i <laughs> and we constantly talk about oh have you seen this person on insta and have you seen this and this is some good advice and you know, we'd agree and, and, and try it if we felt like it was something that could work for us. Um, because we don't want to be, I mean, we're all, we're, we're both grown up, we've both grown up with different parenting, myself and my wife as well, which is another, you know, a level of stuff to think of. Yeah. My, my parents were kind of a little bit more strict maybe with me in some areas, um, but were very loose in others. Um, they had a different way of dealing with things. Their approach to discipline is different to Linny's parents. So you kind of that, no matter how how much you try, that is kind of ingrained in you a little bit as well. So oh, absolutely, yeah. you are dealing with that in your own way. But I was really pleased that me and Linny were able to kind of agree on that and, and just try for the tactics that didn't mean that we were ultimately shouting at our own child. That was the, the yeah to kind of avoid every now and again you know you just they, they just get you so far and you just sometimes you end up uh, losing it and shouting and then you feel bad about it afterwards but um at least we, we give it a good go <laughs> yeah i think that's what one thing i'm conscious of like i always sometimes just sit back and try and look at my content like holistically as if a random was to, to come and look at it and i, I i'm all i I've picked up a few times I need to make it as real as possible and like you said there like you know I yell everyone yells which is why important is important for accounts like the dad vibes and other parenting sort of specific accounts are as real as possible because often you get the accounts run by maybe people who've got grown-up kids and when you look back you might look back through rose-tinted glasses and I mean no one is calm a hundred percent of the time so certainly over the last 12 months i've tried to create content around what happens when you snap <laughs> and, and when you lose it because everyone i don't care who they are is gonna snap and lose it at some point so what do we do then and obviously it offers up opportunities to you know model repair and apologize and things like that but then again when i share that type of content i'm conscious that <laughs> when you do lose it you're not always in the right headspace to model repair and apologize so yeah it's a bit of a i think it's a bit of a tough one it's a tough one but i think that i mean one of the things that helped us about um following you for example when when linny told me about that the dad vibes and i looked and i thought oh, okay he's got a son called luca who's not that much older than charlie um and seems as though every now and again there's a little moment which is similar to what we've got this is going to be really good and I think what, what helps is, okay, yeah, sometimes we can't help it. We are going to yell because we've reached the end of our patience. But there is always then that opportunity just to take it back again afterwards and, 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 and look at it and think, oh, hang on. And there's been so many instances where, thanks to your content, where I've looked back and thought, actually, yeah, it's, it's because he can't you know, translate his emotions and it's not actually him, it's me. I've, my, I've lost my patience and it's actually probably me that's caused the issue here. Now that isn't the case all the time, obviously. No, no. But it does help, I think, to stop and have those moments because otherwise you just end up going down this, you know, cul-de-sac where you're just shouting all the time for the same repeated behaviour rather than actually trying to understand what is causing the behaviour. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, so Ch when does um, Charlie turn five? Is it, you said February? The next, February. Is it, he, he turned. Oh, it's, okay. Gone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because cause we're noticing now with Lucas, so he's five in March. So he's now starting to, 
he's still experiencing big emotions. He can certainly regulate them a lot better and communicate them a lot better. But, you know, he's, his life is now a lot fuller. He's at school. He's got friends who have all got their own opinions. And it seems like he's dealing with a lot more, like, <laughs> on the level of, like, an adult. You know, he's got his own little world going on. Um, and at times, like, I look, I look at him and I can see him mulling things over. And I just want to always... <laughs> like not snap him out of it but just encourage him to you know be happy a lot of the time but I've been doing a lot of reading around that and that's one thing I'm working on at the moment as a parent is that you can't force it's not about forcing your children to be happy it's about encouraging them to understand that we all feel sad because you know Luca feels sad sometimes at school when he's had a negative interaction with a friend um, disappointed frustrated and then once you can sort of navigate those, that then allows you to experience happiness a little bit more often. So that's where we are at the moment with Luca in terms of his um, his his little life. And I, I'm sure you'll get there. Like, are you still experiencing the big emotions at the moment with Charlie? Or yeah, we are. I mean, Charlie, uh, when when he turned two, that's when we started noticing that. You know, I think once they start to form a character and they just start using their first words, he was. Uh, head banging quite a lot and yeah you just have meltdowns um i don't think that the covid and lockdown thing helps because as you probably experienced with with luca as well you know they're trapped inside a house for this long period of time when ordinarily these children would be going to nursery and, and clubs and things like that and mixing with other children and yeah charlie found it very difficult in any social environment i mean we wouldn't even be able to take him in the car or take him into a supermarket um because there'd just be a meltdown and it was um it felt like a nightmare that would never end but obviously as with children they were phases that have gone but then there's a new phase that's come along and he still struggles with his emotions um we do have some right he's with him but because he's now four and we're able to be able to have a conversation with them they are fewer but yeah they can be greater because now he is able to <laughs> actually shout at us back and things like that. So there are still some challenges for sure that we've got before he makes his way into school. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's quite... Because you mentioned there about being conscious of not being able to go in the car or the shop. It is quite debilitating, isn't it, to your life when there's that they're going through an intense period of strong emotions. And it's also quite scary. Like, I remember when... During lockdown, so Luca must have just turned to... And I used to be like itching to finish working from the office, get downstairs and have a couple of hours with him. You know, I'd swap with my wife, but you know, half of the time we'd swap and then he'd have an epic, you know, emotional outburst and meltdown because Laura's gone upstairs to work, but she's on an important call. So we're like battling on the stairs and it just, it, it just completely turns like what I was hoping to be a positive experience into an afternoon of just <laughs> of just turmoil and it's I guess the biggest tip is not to take it personally because it isn't a personal thing yeah. and that maybe makes you a better place to respond but it is so debilitating and tough to deal with and it is quite scary especially when it's so intense like I remember Luca like charging at me and hitting me and just really going really just being unable to to regulate his emotions whatsoever. So yeah, it, it is tough. It sounds exactly the same as Charlie for us and it, it was really debilitating and, it, and the moments that you want to have as a family that you've, I, I don't know, painted and envisaged in your mind that sometimes they don't materialise and days just turn into hell. Um, and that and that was, you know, happening quite regularly um, because, and also you find yourself getting jealous of other parents because you're, you're looking at children you're looking at parents with children the same age as Charlie and they're, you know, sitting in a coffee shop, quiet, really polite, listening to everything. Yeah. Oh, what are we doing wrong? And that's the thing is you think it's you doing something wrong. And do you think that impacted sort of the activities and the things that you organised to do with Charlie? So, for example, it's such an effort. I remember us taking Luca to the beach Um when it was just the three of us, like it's even more of an effort now, but that was just such an effort to, to get us to the beach. We sit down, we, you know, we get the windbreaker up straight away, epic meltdown um, for about half an hour. And, you know, 
Laura and I just look at each other and say, is is it worth it? Is it worth all of this hassle to get us to the beach? But did you find it impacted the things you organised and did as a family or did you continue to just push on? I have to take my hat off to my wife, to be honest, because for me, it okay. impacted um, the decisions that I wanted us to make because I would try... And, and now I look back, um, this was wrong to do, but I would try and limit the amount of possibilities of meltdowns that we would face. Okay, so you'd articulate your life in and around. But my wife would that... be there and she was adamant, we've got to try again, we've got to try again. And we had the same thing, we live on a beach and we took him to the beach and it would be a nightmare or we'd take him in a coffee shop and everyone would be looking around at you and I'm not, um, I, I, I don't like that, that feeling. But my wife doesn't care um, because all she's felt okay. is Charlie and she doesn't really care what anyone else thinks, which is a great, uh, you know, great thing for her to have. Um, and so we did keep on going and we, we, you know, every now and again, we would have success. And so, you know, I would sit back and go, ah, oh, you know, well done. We, we actually had a good day there. That's nice. Um so that's where perhaps me and Linnea are quite different in the fact that she would persevere in order to try and yeah. you know, make it right and, and hopefully get snap him out of it because you know, again we, we can now go down the beach. He loves going down the beach and that's not such a problem. Oh amazing. Um and you know, we don't have any problems with him going to supermarkets and stuff like that. So his social side has has U turned it's completely, which is which is great. Um but I would probably put that down more to my wife than me because I would try and avoid a scenario because I could already, I don't know if you did this yourself, but I'd, we'd maybe plan to go to a theme park or something like that. And I've already painted the picture of what that day is going to be. It fills me. Oh yeah, massively. <laughs> and then I just, <clears throat> oh no, I don't think we should do it. I think it, your dynamic sounds a lot like myself and Laura, because I'm always conscious about what's going on around me, who's thinking what, um, even um, when we lived in our old house, like if Luca was to have a meltdown in the garden, you know, with the neighbours in the garden. But Laura is very much like in a bubble with Luca. It's Luca's needs. Um, let's just continue pushing forward and organise um, activities. And to be fair, she's we've gone on two abroad holidays completely like spearheaded by Laura. She, I remember back last year, she was like, should we book Lanzarote and, and, you know, go in a couple of weeks time? And I'm like, Ooh, you know, how's Luca going to be on the plane? You know, he, he, he's not, he's, he's not sure about the plane. She's like, he'll be fine. W what if he cries on the plane? Well, if he cries, he cries. We'll, we'll sue then. Um, and if it wasn't for her pushing it, um, I, I'm just the person that maybe puts blockers in the way, but she just smashes them out of the way. And then we, it, and to be fair, it does unearth uh, uh, amazing memories. So yeah. I, I guess, like you and your partner, I guess you just compliment each other, don't you? And yeah, we've we've even like, last night, even Tom, we had the, the conversation. There's a friend's wedding um, in September, and some parents are taking their kids, and others are not. And, and we're okay. We're having this sort of tug of war at the moment as to whether or not we should take him, or whether or not we shouldn't, um, because we're we've not taken him on an abroad holiday. And my fear is, what if he has a meltdown on the plane? Um, mm. you know, or ruins the wedding, you know, on the wedding day is just gone into absolute uh, turmoil and is screaming at the top of his voice. And um, we, we seem to be on a similar page as to what to do with that. But I think that the, the challenges that Charlie has given us, I, I, I genuinely believe has stood in the way a little bit of us having a second child as well. We're okay. currently... You know, not I wouldn't say actively trying, but we're currently trying to have a, another baby. But I don't really want to leave it too long. Um, but I, I think we would have probably had one sooner. Was were Charlie not to have been such a difficult child, if that makes sense? And it sounds horrible, okay. But it is genuinely been a barrier for us. Right, that's interesting. So, obviously, Charlie's just turned four. Is that a question you and your partner get? asked quite often you know when are you having another child is there another on the way i mean yeah. i imagine to, to be fair i find that question quite offensive when, when if people were to ask that because obviously we've had quite a journey um laura's been pregnant seven times we've had four first trimester losses we had a daughter last year so 
whenever anyone asks that i just like spit the truth at them and it sort of just <laughs> sends them back a little bit but fortunately we you know we had mia over christmas um but yeah that was a question we were asked over and over again certainly i think when you're in your 20s you assume um and, and you've just talked about your barrier there um putting charlie's needs first you assume you know we'll have two or three kids there's going to be two years between each they'll be best of friends yeah. we'll get pregnant we'll have a baby and then when you actually start trying to have a family either you get smashed in the face with you know miscarriage and baby loss or l like you say that you know you need to put the needs of your child first and maybe in your in um in your example the putting charlie's needs before everything else was maybe what stopped you pushing forward with having a second yeah i mean we i still hope that we we can have a second because i know that no two children are the same we are aware of that and i think that we would do things slightly differently and not be quite if we were to have another child that had the same emotions as charlie i think that we'd be able to react in a certainly a better way because it was a shock to the system initially because obviously as new parents yeah. you don't really know what's happening and you <laughs> Um, and so that would that would uh, certainly be a positive. So I'm 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 praying that we are able to to have another one. Um, but I just think that that has certainly been a bit of a barrier for us um, in recent years. Although I don't want it to sound like you know every single day is um, a nightmare with Charlie because no no not at all. You know this is the thing with Charlie, and I'm sure it's the same with Luca and, and many other parents with children as well. You know when he's on form. He's such a dear little boy, you know, he's kind, he's so thoughtful, he's generous, he wants to hug and he, he you know, it, they're just the best days. You finish those days, don't you? And you just, you want to punch the air. Yeah. Yeah, what a day. I wish I could have that again. And then the next day, you just come crashing back to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something about like a positive experience or interaction with your child that, well, for, for me, it sort of recharges me or re-energizes me. Yeah. Um, and certainly, to be fair, when Mia come along, I don't like going from no kids to Luca was was a transition. But I think we were both in a place, you know, we were ready to be parents, so we both dived in with two feet. I think the transition from one to two for me personally has been one of the hardest things I've ever done, just because every life as you know it just turns on its head all of the um one-on-one -on -one time with luca goes out the window all of the routines go out of the window um you know luca needs to be a lot more patient as we deal with you know changing me as nappy or rocking her off to sleep and it's just i i didn't prepare myself for how intense these last 12 weeks were, were, were going to be and I, i've spoken to quite a few parents with three kids and more often than not they say the from zero to one, one to two, or two to three, the hardest transition was one to two, um, because you're juggling the needs of another child. Um, even things like the school drop-off, like me and Laura like to do everything together, so we did the school drop-off together, the school pick-up. And I get I'm fortunate that I can, I'm in a position to do that, but just being able, to, just now having to split resource on absolutely everything. Bedtime, I did every bedtime with Luca, I've I've done one bedtime since December, like since Mia come along, because Laura's breastfeeding and she doesn't get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Lucas, so she takes bedtime, and I rock Mia off to sleep, which is good because I get some alone time with Mia. But yeah, it, I, I I loved um, all of the interactions and all of the experiences we had with Lucas so much that <laughs> obviously at the moment Mia's personality is still developing. She's just a, you know a baby who just needs all of her needs responded to 24-7 um, until we get to that point, you know, where she, her personality just bursts out. Um, but yeah, that has been intense to me. So my advice would be, I think you'll know when you're ready. Um, and it sounds like you're sort of getting to that place. Um, so yeah, just not to put you off, but... <laughs> um, one of the things that I was a little bit concerned about as well was because Charlie can be quite possessive of not just his toys but of us as parents as well you know how would he react to a new baby in the house but then we've been quite lucky in a way because my sister um not that long ago had had a little baby boy and i i'm very close to my sister she only lives literally about 
a thousand meters down the road and so oh wow we've been um you know in regular contact with them i see them quite a lot and i've been really um impressed and and touched at how charlie's reacted to that um you know he's he really or he almost sees his cousin as a brother already and he's really gentle and kind and hasn't you know every now and again there might be a moment where um unexpectedly um his cousin might pick up a, a toy and he's like, no, that's my toy, but a, a kid thing. Yeah. In general, I've been really impressed with how he has reacted to another child kind of entering the space because before that as well, my grandparents, I mean, Charlie was their only grandchild and now all of a sudden there's this new baby. That's okay. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, he's reacted really well to it, which is a bonus when, you know, you're thinking of trying for another. Yeah. I think, we've not experienced so i know you know a lot of people have two under two or three under three which i've got no idea how anyone could navigate through that it seems quite intense i think luca at four and a half when mia was born or just over four and a half um you know he's that a little bit more developed so we've not had the the hitting or anything like that um which i know a lot of parents go through um but we, we've had a couple of, you know, he gets frustrated with her crying a little bit, so we need to be clear that that's her only way of communicating at the moment. Um, he said a couple of times, you love Mia more than me, which, again, is not nice to hear, but an opportunity just to sit down with him and have a little chat. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we've we've navigated it, we've navigated through it with not too much trouble. Um, I think the... It, it, but then again, when she becomes old enough to play and share toys, he'll be that, again, that, that little bit more developed. He'll be five, six. So, yeah, I think two under two, three under three. It would be nice to chat to some parents that have been in that position. But I, I couldn't imagine navigating through that. It seems like it would be quite challenging. Yeah. But for us, it's been... It, we've had our challenges, and I've shared a lot about that on on um, the Dad Vibes, but it's not be, been as intense as as some of the parents I chat to on, on the dad vibe. So, so yeah, it seems like obviously all going well for, for you guys, Charlie, hopefully might be, you know, between four and five. Well, we hope so. The for... thing we're struggling with at the moment, to be honest, is, is the, is the lashing out. I mean, he's, he's not, you know, he, he's gone through the phases where he'd have meltdowns and we don't really see those very often anymore um, uh, or in public, unless he's not getting his own way. But, the only problem at the moment is when he doesn't get his own way is this lashing out, you know, scratching, hitting, slapping, yeah. nipping, um, and and finding new ways to just be a little bit devious, I suppose. Um, and trying to cope with that is has just been quite tough of late because then now he's getting, now he's having proper conversations with us as well. He's shouting at us as well as hitting us and, trying to deal with that in a calm manner when it yeah some days like it goes on forever um can be quite difficult um we had one of those literally yesterday morning um and so yeah that's the only thing that we're looking to kind of hopefully get away from before he goes to school because you know he does it at nursery as well we sometimes speak to we've got a good relationship with the nursery that he goes to and We've had a few instances there, and obviously it, it, the last thing you want to hear when you pick your kid up from nursery is, you know, Charlie's lashed out at another child today, and you just think, oh, where does he get it from? Because, you know, me yeah. aren't aggressive people in any way. He doesn't even hear us shouting at each other. So, yeah, that is difficult at the moment. And is, is that just at nursery and at home with you guys, or does he do that with grandparents as well? Um, not so much with grandparents. He will every now and again, but I think as as most parents listening to this will probably know, grandparents are you know very good at um, turning a blind eye to that. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and you know, obviously there isn't as as much. No, I wouldn't say discipline because there's certainly discipline there, but I think that he gets away with an awful lot more at his grand. Yeah. And he will do at home so he doesn't do it as much there um that's just a natural thing though isn't it i think that we're all we've all kind of grown oh yeah the same thing you know we've all been i didn't want i didn't i don't like even now being told what to do by my dad <laughs> if he <does. laughs> so, that's kind of natural really yeah i think 
well, I'm certainly fair with Luca. Between th- this last year, developmentally, he's just had like a, it, fa- it feels like an epic surge. He's, it's like he's just turned into like a fully grown. Maybe it was when Mia come along. Like the moment you see Luca next to Mia, he just looks like a teenager. Um, but I remember having a few concerns similar to yours, maybe six months out before he was starting school. Um, and then also with um, reading and writing as well, like we, we didn't really do much outside of like learning through play. So before Lucas started school, um, he could just about write his name, but he, he couldn't recall letters or anything like that. And literally he's been in school since um, September. Um, he can read sentences now. Uh, we live in Wales, so we do um, like they do a, a smaller Welsh curriculum. So he can um, he, he's learning words in Welsh. He can uh, recite the alphabet. Um, so I, I was blown away at how much um, he thrived at school. Um, and I think talking to parents at the school drop off, I think everyone's in a similar boat that they they can't believe how quickly their kids come on both in terms of like dealing with emotions and things like that because obviously they're in situations um more frequently uh, without parents around to, to to learn how to manage and navigate through them and then yeah. obviously on the learning side uh, as well that's good to hear to be honest because there are some yeah areas you know that we look at um you know certain things with his dexterity and with a when you put a pencil in his hand and stuff like that and you you know you look and you think well I, you know you see some other kids who are able to do so much and then you look and you think oh is there something wrong do we need to be worried and um because obviously with the uh, luckily enough with the with the children's book that I have I've been to a lot of primary schools and so while I'm there I obviously do have a good look around and I'm seeing there is such a dramatic difference um, in that developmental stage of a child between the age of four and five. We, you can kind of oh, massively, yeah, clearly with the children that are at the school. So I'm hoping that once he gets into that environment, that things will will move on. Yeah, I mean, that, that I don't think there was any expectation when Lucas started in reception for him to be, you know, r- writing or r- reading. It was literally just. I think they expect a blank canvas and then obviously they can roll out um, their ways of doing things. Um, You know, Luca learns in phonics. So as a parent to support their learning from home, you know, you want to maybe get on top of that. Um, You know, we don't do homework or anything like that, but we do try and support his learning, like read to him every night, Um, do some creative stuff around writing um, that isn't just like sit there, a monotonous sit down um, and learning task. But yeah, I had similar concerns to you before Lucas started school, but I've been probably my biggest, one of my biggest surprises as a parent, how quickly he's come on at school. Um, so yeah, hopefully that puts your mind at ease a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so to, uh, talking of your um, children's book, then do you want to have a little chat about that? Just to um, yeah, sure. explain what, what, how did you go from commentating on the MotoGP to uh, <laughs> writing a, a children's book? Yeah, it's quite uh, different. Um, that's, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> I was, when I was uh, younger and I was at school, I always used to love reading and writing um, and illustrations. And I, I, I suppose when, you, when, as you grow up, you just forget about the things that you're into as a kid. Um, and then it, upon having Charlie... Um, and we've read to him ever since he was born, basically. Um, we're really keen on that. And, he, you know, every single day he reads stories with us and we read bedtime stories. And, and when, when we had Charlie, it suddenly brought all of these uh, feelings back about reading and writing. And I thought, oh, wow, I remember how much I used to love these as, as kids myself. And so and getting into character and stuff like that. Um, and so I, I always kind of like the idea, like a lot of people, of writing a children's book. Um, but then when when COVID hit, um, I would create the odd story, just make it up because we had time on hand, um, yeah. make up stories to read to Charlie. So not just from your average book. Um, and one of them, my wife said, oh, that isn't, that isn't so bad. Um, you know, why don't you look into it? And so I went and bought a couple of books to read about how to become a children's author and realized quite quickly that it isn't as easy as it sounds um but really wanted to pursue with it and and see whether or not 
anyone was interested because I just thought it would be amazing to have a children's book out and, you know, not with a view to becoming David Williams or Julia Donaldson, but, um, <laughs> you know, great to, to have that out there and be able to read a story to Charlie and say that, you know, this is, this is for you. Um, and so, yeah, we did that. I sent it out to a load of agents. It got rejected left, right and centre. Um, okay until Miss Wright Publishing came along and said that they liked the story. And then, you know, hey presto, it became a book in, um, August, it was released in August, 2021. And um, I think more than the excitement of having a book out and the great feeling of being able to read a story to Charlie, because in, in the beginning, that was such a magical feeling for me, uh, is, is the fact that I can take it to schools. I've really, really enjoyed yeah. school visits because you just get a lot of joy from watching children be creative and their excitement about, you know, I suppose realizing that anyone can do it. You know, it's not just, uh, you know, I, I, I had nothing. I had no background in that at all. I actually did not do so well at writing at school. Um, but writing a children's book, you know, allows you to use your imagination. And um, I've really enjoyed doing that. And it's been nice to get some, Kind of important morals into a story as well for children yeah and that maybe we've dealt with as adults that um subjects that maybe i wasn't aware of when i was a kid so i think it's it's nice to do that and have, have you got more idea like have, have you got ideas around potentially a series of books or is it are you just one and done is it quite an an intensive um creative process it is quite it is quite intensive actually yeah i mean it is yeah how long it takes to, to get something down. I I mean, I'm not planning on doing a series with this particular book, but you never know. But I have already written another and I'm halfway through another. Um, I sent out the second book to a few agents and again, it's been rejected and it's just kind of deciding what to do with it. Maybe I need to change a few bits, um, finding the time to do it. I'd love to be able to have a couple out here and there because I think it will just be really cool. I don't have any visions of it bit going, you know, massive but um i'd love to it's just such a a tough process um you know, i can imagine yeah. if anybody can do it um you know it's not something that's going to make you rich um <laughs> i, I want to put that out there no i straight away um but it is there is so, so much reward that comes out of it but it's also if i want to self-publish obviously it's an expensive operation to get done um so yeah i've got to work out a few ways of um Hopefully, you know, getting somebody to, to like the book and, and go out there because I prefer the second book that I've written than the first one that's been published, which is a bit bizarre. Um, and maybe just getting the first book out there a bit more. It's kind of locally, it's done very, very well. It's in Waterstones now and things like that. So, um, oh, wow. The great thing about children's books is that they never go out of date. So, you know, no, they're evergreen, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, I feel like you can, you know, make it grow further and get it further afield. So that's been quite exciting as well um but it's, it's a great world and industry to be in it's just like anything it's it's tough it's not um it's not easy to do and i think a lot of people might look at a 32 page story and think well anyone can do that um but <laughs> it is very very especially if you decide like i did to make it rhyme as well that took a few nights away from me <laughs> <laughs> i i think it's quite commendable anyone because you said there about it not making you rich and, and to, to to dedicate your time to something that you know maybe is, isn't going to make you rich but you know it's something that you're going to be super proud of it's going to live on it's it, you know it's evergreen i think that's that's really important and i think similarly people ask me like why i post on the dad vibes every day you know the dad vibes doesn't make me rich but it, it it's something i'm proud of and it's sort of the the, the springboard to what it leads to the connections I make with other parents the the, the messages of thanks I get um, so by making it part of like a healthy part of my life um, that it becomes like my creative space and my self care and it sounds like that's what this does for you yeah exactly um, like like you if you if you feel like you've which you have already hence why we're talking if you've you know made a parent's day or you've changed the way that they deal with day-to-day -day life then that's going to be a feeling that no one no money in the world can can no it's an amazing feeling and for me if i see par um, kids parents buying the book and children enjoying it and if it 
means that one child decides that they'd love to pursue being an author or an illustrator when they're older, then that's, you know, an amazing feeling for me. So, um, yeah, it is a, it's a very similar thing. You know, it, it's what it leads to um, and the conversations that it can open up as a result. And I've had so many great um, moments with the book, meeting parents, meeting teachers, being at schools. And it's yeah. so helped me as a parent as well because, you know, I'm able to have a look around and speak to other parents more about what issues or, you know, they might be having with their children and stuff like that. And it just puts your mind at ease. So it's, it's opened up doors in, in that way as well. And one thing I did want to uh, quickly chat about was um, we've spoken a little bit off camera about um, you making a few changes to, as, as Charlie's got older, to be home more. It, yeah. Is that right? So it does this, does the authoring books and, and writing books make up part of that? What sort of changes are you making and what motivated you to want to maybe be home a little bit? I think... Um... To be honest, when I first started doing motorcycle racing comment commentary, um, I was in my early 20s and I genuinely had a dream and, and probably a little bit of an ego to believe that it was going to make me the, all the money I needed in the world, <laughs> be able to retire young and, um, you know, I'd have this amazing job with an incredible income and I'd be on TV and as I grew up and got older, I quickly realized that obviously, you know, that was just a, a young pipe dream, but it was obviously a unique job and one that I love doing. Um, but I think once you have a child, your perspectives on everything change. Um, because all of a sudden, the most important thing in your life is is that child. It's not your, you know, dreams and ambitions. And and for me, I'd, I'd spent, I've spent so many years doing the, the bike racing commentary. And, and I think it was seven years that I'd been work, working overseas and working in, in world championships that I decided at the end of 2021, yeah, end of 2021, um, that I would stop the, the world traveling um, and that I'd do motorcycle racing here, which is why I do British Superbikes for Eurosport. Uh, last year also I did, I covered the Isle of Man TT and then obviously I did the book work. Oh, cool. book work definitely played a little part in that as well. Um, and since I've been home, um, there's been advantages and disadvantages to that because I've obviously been able to spend a lot more time with Charlie, but it, you know, it does mean that there are more meltdowns than, than, than before. Um, yeah. But also now I'm looking at everything through a different prism, I would say, because I'm now even thinking about what the future holds because bike racing commentary is good fun but there's some other jobs that are potentially on the horizon at the moment that might be more stable for my future and for us as a family and um there's some stuff that might come up that might be helping the community as well and i'm quite proud of the town that we live in um and again because of the book i'm able to explore those avenues so um i would say that first and foremost charlie is the reason the main reason why I wanted to come home and be more at home more with the family because I think um, having spoken to some people in the industry, they have kids that are 18, 19 or 20 and they, they all said the same thing that they just haven't really had that relationship with them. And it's, right. and it's now too late. They're, they're stuck in the industry. They're pigeonholed. And, and if they leave that, then they don't know what else they're going to do. And I thought, well, Charlie's still young. I can come back and do this if I want. Potentially, I'm not being arrogant on that. I'm just yeah. chance that I could come back to this, but I cannot get back the time that I spend with Charlie. Um, no, and so that was really the the main reason why I made changes. It it feels like that line of thinking. It seems like dads are more consciously aware of the importance of the early years. Like certainly in the sporting world, I know these people are at the end of their career, but we're seeing it. Like Sebastian Vettel, for example, has come out and said he wants to be at home with his with his young family. Rafa Nadal, I know he's at the end of his career, but he said the same thing. Sam Warburton, who's the Welsh rugby captain, you know, he could probably continue playing, but he said he wants that time at home with his young family, time that he'll never get back. And it just seems, I, I don't know if it's a time we're living in, but yeah, people seem more consciously aware that, you know, it does it does matter and time is more valuable than anything. Um, 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. And also from a personal perspective, I remember my dad working tirelessly when we were kids and, and, and from, you know, the age of maybe four to eight or nine, just not really seeing him a lot because he'd be working such long hours. Um, you know, I think he'd only ever see us when we were in our pajamas until it was maybe the weekend or something like that. And so maybe that's subconsciously played a part in my mind as to, you know, wanting to be around more um, and just giving him as much time as possible because like all of us, I, I, you know, I treasure the really good moments that we can have as a family together and the things that we can do. Um, and quite regularly, I find myself, not just from a family perspective, but from a social perspective as well, you know, are you free for this or are we going to go here? And I'll be like, no, I'm in France or no, I'm in Malaysia. Oh, okay, yeah. It's difficult to, to, to manage that. Um, and I wasn't really in the right headspace either because I'd be flying home, I'd be really tired, I didn't have to try and deal and acclimatise back to family life. And so, yeah, it was just the right choice to make all around. Yeah, I think... I've always been passionate about the early years anyway, like the first four years before school, like it's so important because there's that level of flexibility because, you know, your your, your child isn't in that rat race of, of, of going to school if you if you go down that route. Um, so, yeah, being able to, especially when they're in school, to be available in the mornings just, you know, for an hour just to do breakfast. Like I love doing that because that's a bit of time with with, with Luca being able to pick him up and you know see him when he's running out of school and then maybe getting an hour going for a coffee or something just having that work-life balance to capture those little moments else like you said you can get in that rat race and it's only really weekends where you'll be spending time when they're at school so um yeah i hope all that pans out for you have you made any concrete decisions as of yet or is it all are you just going to let it play out um there's a couple of things that have happened that i've I've got to keep under wraps for now, but um, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah, it looks like, you know, in general, I'm going to be continuing. One thing I know is that I'm going to be continuing doing some form of bike racing commentary this year. Um, but then there also is going to be some other work that I take on um, locally, which will see me a little busier, I suppose. Um, yeah. Charlie will be in school soon, and so it won't be, you know, quite so drastic. But I just feel like, from a personal and family perspective, that it's the right thing to do. So, yeah, cool. I think we could we could chat for hours, but I'm going to close out with three questions, if that's okay. Um, fairly lightweight. So, question one, Steve, is knowing what you know now, what parenting advice would you give yourself before you became a parent? Uh, don't panic. That would be probably Good, nice. the, the, the biggest thing um, is not to panic in scenarios that you're potentially worried about because ultimately I do think that a parent's instinct normally is, is pretty spot on um, and you know if there's something wrong and I think you should just trust in yourself a little bit more. I think that's something that I would certainly do second time around. Yeah, cool. Um, what's the one thing you feel you need to work on as a parent? <laughs> <laughs> well you should probably ask my wife this rather than me um <laughs> the one thing that i should work on as a parent i think that um i'm guilty um of um at times when i'm around charlie and i don't think that he wants to be in my company i'm guilty of being having my face in my phone too much um okay when there might genuinely be opportunities for us to actually you know, be with each other or sometimes he might try and grab my attention and my head might be in my phone, whether it's work or whether it's scrolling Instagram or pull my hand up to things like that. Yeah. I would, I would I'd probably say that that's my most, yeah, that's the, the, the one flaw that I would, I would probably try and correct. That's an honest one. That's a, and a good one. I'm sure many parents can, can, can can relate to that and i think now more than ever with social media the, the way it's structured even if you pop on your phone for 30 seconds you know with the the, the scrollable reels that are, uh, you know a 10 second videos you get caught up in that loop for minutes even hours go by um certainly in the evening so yeah it's yeah, a good one to be mindful of listen to this tom because she, she'll be quite impressed that i said that um okay i mean i i, I 
I love the honesty. Parenting truths. That's what we want. We want truths. <laughs> um, and then finally, to close out uh, on a positive note, what's the best thing about being a parent? I think just getting, seeing them, seeing children happy um, and and hearing their laugh and seeing them enjoy and seeing them grow. It's just amazing. I don't think there's a, a better feeling in the world than than seeing your child enjoy what they're doing um, and just their smile. I mean, it's, a, it's unbelievable how many times, you know, you might be hitting your head against the wall on a bad day thinking you want the day to be over. And then just in the space of two seconds, it can completely change yeah. of a smile or a laugh or a giggle. Um, there's nothing like it. I think, yeah, if, if as a parent, you thrive off that, that's what, yeah. keeps you wanting to be involved and showing up every day yeah. because obviously we're all going to go through the tough times but but yeah the, 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 those little po pockets of um moments with your little one yeah are, are just more than enough to cancel out anything yeah uh, any of the negative interactions yeah i agree with that um well thank you for your time steve and i'm sure we will chat um again very soon but yeah like i said um before I hit record, I just wanted this podcast to be, well, the podcast as a whole, just to be open and honest parenting conversations and then just let, just release them to the world and just let people listen. And I'm sure parents can take um, bits of validation, motivation and positivity away from each of these conversations. So yeah. Thank you. It's been, it's been a pleasure. I, I was really you know excited when you got in touch. Um, you've helped us as a family so much. And so, really appreciate that and um and if we are lucky enough to be able to have baby number two i might be tapping you up for some of <laughs> yeah we should jump on a podcast on maybe week two or three or, or maybe weekly we'll do a weekly episode <laughs> brilliant all right well thanks for your time steve cheers tom thanks mate cheers bye bye